And what I thought about is, what has God shown to me recently? And is there anything in there that is something that he's given to me that I could use as a basis of something to talk about? Because I didn't have a subject in mind and the week was running pretty short. And then I thought about this image, if you would. You know the cartoons that we could pick up and read? I was going to say we used to, we still can, I guess, if you get a paper. But they had the little cloud thoughts. So if you would, just imagine three cloud thoughts. And inside of those is something that I think is, has led me to where I am today and what I want to talk about. The first cloud thought, last week, if you were here, Nathan in his sermon started with two things and the first cloud thought has those two and then I'm going to add to that. The first thing he said, if you remember, is, is he said when Pontius Pilate was trying to decide what judgment he was going to pass on Jesus and it's in John 18, 38, he said Pilate and then he added probably um, kind of sarcastically said, what is truth? You may remember that. The next thing he said is truth today is, is really just about anything. That some people believe that my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth. Well, those are the two statements that he started with. And I thought about that and when he said it last week, I thought, that reminds me of the road trip to truth. Tom mentioned that they're getting ready to film season four. We watched season one and two on Wednesday nights at the church for those of you that weren't there. And one thing that really stuck out to me, and first off, if you don't know what Road Trip to Truth is, I'll mess this up, but I'll try. It is a, it starts off with you have a camera crew and somebody that, uh, is going to go and interview kids on campus and he gets their permission to talk to them and it's a one-on-one -on -one type thing. And this team that's going there are, are going there for a purpose of teaching the truth to students on college campuses and they're, they're focused on the southeast just because you have to pick a region and that was closest for the show. And as they teach these kids the truth, what they're trying to teach them is, is answers to life's biggest questions. Now, the crew that went out were, in their talk, they would ask a question and get an answer. And then the team of experts, and there was five of them that get used on different shows to kind of expand on what the kids say as they show the videos, and then they, they kind of put into it what, what this means biblically. And Tom is one of the experts, by the way, and he's fixing to film two segments in season four, so he's getting ready for that. And... We got a preview of one of his answers uh, that he's going to, one of the shows he's going to do soon uh, with the class this morning. So you missed that if you weren't there. But one of the things that really surprised me, and I didn't realize this was going on, and show you how, I guess, maybe um, sheltered I am, but a lot of the students, it didn't happen just on one campus. It happened on multiple campuses. So this is not something that's being taught in one school, but something being taught in a lot of schools and probably throughout the country. And they would say, if you, if you have this back and forth, my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth. It's called relative truth. And essentially what it means is, it's truth for one person doesn't have to be the same truth for somebody else. And I was just thinking that that makes absolutely no sense. But they've been taught this and they believe that. And you know, I st started thinking about that. If, if everything's relative, there's no absolute truths. And so absolute truth, uh, would, without the absence of absolute truth, you wouldn't have God's word. You know, explain to me how we arrived to where we are today and some of the things that's going on in our country, not to get political, but it's just, it's just the truth, right? Things like defunding police, open borders, runaway deficit spending, 
And the one that I really can't understand is this biological male that's transgender and thinks that now he's a woman all of a sudden and he wants to play and, and compete in women's sports and use women's public restrooms. And people say, well, that's his truth, so we need to allow him to do that. And some of these biological men are competing in women's sports. And you got companies like Target that are letting anybody that says, hey, I need to go to the women's restroom because that's, that's who I am. And they'll just let them go. And they're still allowing people to go. All right, that's one cloud. The next cloud happened 16 days ago, and if you're a visitor, my wife Kim, Kimberly, and I went to Memphis, and we went to a, a, an event uh, for Answers in Genesis was, was having a fundraiser, and we went to that in Memphis. And Ken Ham said, all of this stuff boils down to one thing, and by the way, Ken Ham, if you don't know who he is, he is the founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. And both of those are in north central Kentucky, just south of, of Cincinnati. Ken Ham says that everything really goes all the way back down to the foundational differences between a secular worldview and a biblical worldview foundation. <coughs> It all comes down to those two things. Everything that's going on in our society right now goes back to two foundations in which one you come from or which one you ascribe to. And the warning for us is, is that they say that this secular worldview is, is really catching on and it's, it's growing. And it's found its way in a lot of churches and that's why you hear the things that's going on that's not good in some of the churches across our country. And it's all, if it's creeping into churches, it's creeping into the, the individuals. And so what we gotta be careful of is, is it creeping into my life? Could it? Well, the answer to that one's in the third cloud. I'll just pick one at the top. And the third cloud is based upon Two surveys that I saw just recently and one quote that I picked up just the other day. One, the first survey happened on Thursday last week. It was released by the Pew Research Center and it said 64% of Americans ascribe to or believe in or call themselves Christians. 64%. I thought that was a pretty high number. The next survey was the one from George Barna Institute, and it said 51% of the, of the survey that they took, and this is across the country, so it's pretty representative, and, and usually it's pretty accurate because they have multiple different type, types of surveys, and they check each other with the survey results. 51% believe in this country that they have a biblical worldview. Now here's the warning. But in fact, the survey says only 6% really do. Then I got to thinking about that. You know, that doesn't speak well for the country. But what about us? Is it possible that some of us fall outside of the 6% that have a biblical worldview? And then I thought, it's not just possible, it's statistically, statistically probable that some of us do not have a biblical worldview. And that brought me to the thought that it's worthy of a few minutes of our time this morning to consider that's the two surveys, now the quote. The quote that I picked up, I think it was talking about sports, but I think it can apply to anything. In fact, I think it does. And it said this. It says, our patterns prove our priorities 
and our priorities reveal our passions. That's a lot of peace, so let's do it again. Our patterns prove our priorities and our priorities reveal our passions. Basically, we love, it says in that statement, we'll do what we love. Sounds logical. Well, what does all this mean? And then I thought about the three points, and I thought, well, how do I pull those into something central theme as a focal point, and where do we take it from there? And then I realized when I tried to pull them all together, I couldn't find anything that, that really would fit for expository type, which is in our statement of what we teach. <coughs> and that's a verse-by-verse verse, uh, type of teaching, and it's very effective. Uh, but because I couldn't do that and I felt like, you know, this is something that I, uh, I feel like I'm being led to, so it will be more topical then. Because I couldn't find a group of scriptures that would really be um, complete enough to, to try to go with it. So I thought, okay, so what do I do with this? And then I thought again about Road Trip to Truth and I thought, you know, uh, here's a thought. Now we're all here, for, I was trying to find something that would be tie us all together and worship would certainly be a subject. We're all here today to worship God, hopefully. If not, maybe by the time we leave we will have decided that's why we're here. But I thought, what if somebody, in taking the road trip to truth as an example, say someone came up to you on the street with a camera crew and asked if they could speak for you, with you for a minute and they didn't run you off, so you decided, okay, I'll talk to you. What would you do if they asked you this question? What would your response be? And here's the question. Is it okay to skip church? Now, I would think that a little explanation might be helpful. So when we say skip church, we're not talking about missing church. We're talking about skipping, and there is a difference. And say the interviewer explained that and then asked the question. And if you said, yes, I think it's okay to skip church. And that's your right to answer it any way you want to. And then I think a follow-up question might be, well, if it's okay to skip church, how often can you skip? Now, hopefully you'll be able to see that this is a kind of sounds like a secular worldview question. You know, we start trying to get the limits, pharisaical type thing of, What's proper? How much can they get away with is another way to think of it. Is it okay to skip church? You know, the Bible places worship as the ultimate priority that each of us has is created in God's image. When Satan uh, came to Jesus and Jesus resisted him in the second temptation in the wilderness before Jesus began his ministry. In Luke 4, verse 8, Jesus answered him, quoting scripture to Satan, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only serve. Psalm 102 tells us to worship God with gladness and know that God, that the Lord is God. So worship is our priority. So think of it this way. Just getting it into the physical for a second as a comparison. Do you think it would be okay if we just decided to skip breathing for a day? Not unless you're ready to go see the Lord. And if you're not ready, you certainly don't want to try that. <coughs> Spiritually, how important is it? How important is worship? Spiritually, we cannot survive without it. Hebrews 10, it's really verse 25 I'm looking for, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 23 through 25. And it addresses our meeting together. The Hebrew writer said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. 
Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of of some. You know what that word habit means? It means pattern. It means is it okay to skip church? That's a pattern. We're talking about defining skip as a pattern. And the Hebrew writer, of course it's from God and he's just writing it. Tells us not to forsake or assemble together as someone is has or is in the habit of doing Remember that we said about passion that we have a tendency to, to do the things that we love to do. Well, worship is a natural response. You know, it's not like saying, oh, I've, got to, I've got to go to church today and kind of have a gruff about it. No, that's the wrong attitude. I mean, the problem is in the heart. You can just hear it out of the lips, but it's not where the problem is. It's not in your head, it's in your heart. The natural response is flowing out of a deep love for God. And that goes back to the commandment that uh, in Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, it says in NAV. You shall love the Lord your God. Jesus confirmed this as the greatest commandment. So it's in the New Testament as well. If total, complete love defines passion, if our patterns prove our priorities and our priorities reveal our passions, then we need to look not at our passions, but look at our go back and look at our patterns. I was thinking about a pilot that flew me one day, and we were getting ready to take off. It was a, a seven-seater Navajo twin-engine plane, piston engine. And we were getting ready to take off, and he flew me all the time. He actually was one of the people that hired me. He was the one that interviewed me and hired me, and I, I'd worked with, for him as a co-op, so it was a done deal, I think, before I got there. And he flew all the time. He was a good pilot. You know, a pilot has a pilot checklist, and they do that before they take off. And it's good to have the written form of it in front of you so you don't miss anything. And he was always very particular, as most good pilots would be, about everything. But for some reason or other that day, I don't think he made it to the bottom of the list. I was sitting in the back, normally I'd be in the co-pilot seat. This time I already had drawings out before we even got off the ground. And But when we, were, when we took off, I could feel the plane was tugging back and forth and it was like it was fighting and I thought, well, there must be some headwind today. And I looked out and I didn't really realize anything. I looked up front and in time to see him looking down and he raised the flaps that were down. We, we took off with full flaps down. A lot of lift there, but there's a lot of drag too once you get off the ground. Fortunately, it was a winter day. But the problem was is he must have in his mind thought that the plane's okay, we're ready, good to go. And we can do that if we answer the question of, what's my passion? Is my passion about God? And we're going to say, yes, I am. But if we go back and say, what's your patterns in your relationship with God? And let's just pick one. Let's say, what's your pattern when it comes to going to church? What does the pattern say? We can miss the answer over here, deceive ourselves, and the truth not be in us. If we go back over here and start answering the questions, and it makes us focus on it and think about it, and we'll say, hmm, maybe I'm missing something here. So don't just jump to the end of passion. Look for the patterns. Because worship is a natural response. 
if we love God. Worship is also the place where God lives. You ever heard that? Worship is the place where God lives. The psalmist said God inhabits the praise of his people. Psalm 22, 3. God inhabits the praise of his people. Worship is the very passion of God himself, John 4, 23. And it should intrigue us to no end when it says this. God is seeking those who will worship him. Said so another way, he's actively seeking worshipers. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You ever thought about God's going around the earth, he's searching to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him? Now that sounds like a benefit. Although we don't do things for the benefit, we do it out of response for what we know God is doing for us. Our response to him is to love him back, to worship him. Worship in the Old Testament was something that you just see all over the place in the Old Testament. They were always worshiping. Unfortunately, sometimes it wasn't the true God. In the New Testament church, we see the practice was to worship God. Confirming our primary responsibility before God in Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul urged his readers, saying, Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Well, that tells us how we need to show up. Did you ever think about worship being a prerequisite to service? Back in Luke 4 8, earlier I talked about Jesus' response to Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship comes before service. Was that what that means? Well, maybe a better example. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 41. Martha had Jesus come to the house. And, of course, Jesus had a lot of people following him. So it became a lot of people coming to Martha's house. So Martha was trying to make arrangements and get everything prepared for all the people in Jesus' teaching. Martha's sister Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, I would say worshiping him, listening to him preach. Martha called Jesus aside and she was frustrated by her sister not helping. She had all this work to do and her sister's not helping. She left it to me to do it alone. And Jesus said something special, I think. He said, you're, he told her, he said, you, Martha, you're upset about many things, but one thing is needed and Mary has chosen the right thing. So Mary had chosen to worship Jesus. Worship comes before service. <coughs> Since worship, worship is such a high priority and the main purpose that we were created, I think that's why we need to take at least a few minutes and all these things about the world that's creeping in the lives of people and even into the church around this country, we need to just look at our patterns and see where that takes us to priorities and ultimately to our passion. If it's that important, what is worship? I, remember, I told Tom the other day that when I was a co-op student, the two people that were running the company that I still work at today, they were talking, and one of them was Don Pennington, the other one was Ed Lamb. I'll just tell you who they were. They're both Ed. They won't mind. <coughs> Ed was running the company. He was, he was a, a Lamb, and the, the Forkums and the Lambs owned the company at the time. And Don Pennington was the one that was kind of running everything under him. And I, I just thought highly of both of them. Don Pennington was talking there. They'd both just taken the written test on the, on the pilots. They, they'd done all the stuff they needed to, taken the written test. And it's rare to have someone do a perfect score. Tom did. 
but it's rare, very rare. In fact, I only know of three people I used to know, Pete Thompson <coughs> the third, that's ever done that, that I know of, uh, anywhere around here. But Don Pennington asked Sad Lanham, he said, you made a hundred on your test. He said, yep, I did. He said, how in the world did you do that? And Ed Lanham, I was sitting there as a co-op student at the desk, and they're having a conversation, kind of in a hall, but just right there where I was. And he said, well, Don, it's quite simple. It's a multiple choice test. He said, I just looked for all the wrong answers. And the one that was left was the right one. So I thought about it. If we're going to talk about what worship is, maybe the thing to do is talk about first what it's not. And that may help us better understand the fullness of what it really is. So I wanted to first look at the types of worship that God rejects, because there are some. The first one I'm going to talk about is called ignorant worship. Ignorant worship. Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus said something strange to her. You may recall what he said. You worship what you do not know. Is that a strange comment? I mean, how can you worship something and not know what it is? Well, there's an example also in the New Testament uh, beyond that one. They're both in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 was preaching a sermon. Actually, he went to Areopagus and he was talking to them. And before he got there, he noticed all these altars and idols that were outside. And, and he saw one to an unknown God. And so Paul asked them, you people are superstitious, he started with. And then he asked him, well, I noticed while I was walking in here, I saw the altar to the unknown God. <clears throat> His question, he didn't ask it directly this way, but the question would be, is how do you worship a God you don't know? But right after he confronted him about this unknown God in the New American Standard uh, version, it says, Paul says, what you worship in ignorance. So that's ignorant worship. And it's unacceptable. If only it stopped then. <coughs> but it didn't. It's all across our land today. It's up and down the, the aisles of the churches. It's uh, unfortunate. But it's all over the place. Ignorant worship. People worshiping what they did not know. And you know the thing about it is nothing ever happens for those people. They never change. They come and they sit and, and they go. But it, it makes no difference in their life. Why? Because it's ignorant worship. Because they're worshiping what they do not know. Maybe people come out of habit. Maybe people come out of a social interaction. It gives them a chance to get out of the house and they get to meet people and talk to people. Maybe it's to make them feel better because they know they're not doing right. And so this gives them a little peace of mind, not total, but it gives them some. But it's all meaningless. True worship, we know what it is. In Scripture it says it's worshiping in spirit and in truth. Knowing God. And knowing God means that when you know who God is, then you realize what He does for you each and every day. He not only created you, but He sustains and maintains, right? I mean, everything we have and all that we are, He gives to us. We could do nothing without Him. Try walking without God giving you that ability. Try thinking if He decided to take it away without God giving you that ability. It's just any measure of thing, everything. Try breathing if God says, we're going to stop. And out of that outflow of knowing what he does for us, there's some love and, yes, there's reverence because we realize that he's on his throne. 
what I love about Revelation 4 and what I love about Isaiah 6 is God gave those writers, those men, as he's calling Isaiah to his ministry and he gives him a glimpse of the throne. And John, he got to see maybe, I would say he got to see it in color and Isaiah saw it black and white, but that's not true. But he wrote about the colors, John did. And there's so much there. If you just, if you think, you don't feel like worshiping, just pick up Revelation and read chapter four. And you don't have to read very far. In fact, before you get to the end of it, you'll be ready to go. It's all about knowing who God is. If we don't know God, we can't worship what we do not know, and God does not accept ignorant worship. The second thing that God doesn't accept is improper worship. In the Old Testament, we have several examples, but the one that sticks out in my mind is Nadab and Abihu. You may remember those guys. Here they are. They're fixing to light their censers, and they did it in an improper way. So what happened to them? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, you see that on the altar that there were sacrifices and they were burned on the altar. Well, those guys, when they disobeyed God and, off, and they offered to God unauthorized fire, I guess you could say they became the burnt offering because fire came down and they were both consumed unauthorized fire. In the New Testament, what sticks out in my mind is our congregational reading today. And basically what we're talking about in Romans chapter 1, Paul's writing about man taking the creative work of God, given as a testimony of the greatness of God to man and the might of God to man. And instead of worshiping the creator, to whom the creation points to, man chooses instead to worship the creation. And that's improper worship. And it's unacceptable. <clears throat> then there was a frightening word from God after that. God gave them up. And the only thing I can think about is when God gives up on somebody, they've been given up on. God does not accept ignorant worship and God does not accept Improper worship. And the third one God does not accept is uh, idolatrous worship. The definition of idol worship is the simplest, and I guess it's the simplest form, is anything that you worship instead of God. But I think the fullness of it, it's not just that. It's anything that you allow become, to come between you and the worship of God is an idol not just the form, not just some man-made thing. But what I find hardest to believe is in the book of Exodus. I mean, this is just one of those things that I just, I can't get my head around what these people were thinking. So Moses calls all the people and they have to get uh, wash their clothes and, and purify themselves and they're all going to be around the base of the mountain and God's going to speak to them from the mountain. And he did. And one of the last things that God said to them was do not make cast idols of silver and do not make cast idols of gold. And Moses gets called up to the mountain with God and off he goes. And he's up there for 40 something, 40 days. And then before he gets back down, they have already made a golden calf. And they said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Does that make any sense at all? Well, some of the things we do probably doesn't make sense to other people and certainly not to God. And right after they made that golden calf, thousands of them died because they violated the true concept of worship that they were just told, don't do, and here they go. It just goes to show us how easy we can let things get out of control. 
and get between us and the God we worship. Going back to that quote, our patterns prove our priorities and our priorities reveal our passions. The fourth thing is worship is not about me, it's about him. Worship's not about me. But what happens to us when we go to church and the worship order has a song in it that, you know, we, we don't like that song or we don't know that song or we do know the song but we don't like it or what happens to us when it's something that we really like, an element in the service that just really draws us in and we think, oh, that was a great worship service. You know, our preference is just another example of it's about me and it's wrong. One of the reasons we get so bent out of shape in the so-called worship wars is that we forget that it's not about me. It's about Him. The object of our worship is sitting on the throne. Again, go back to Isaiah 6. Go back to Revelation 4. Or go back to Daryl's reading this morning in Psalm. They were all glimpses of the throne. Fifth, worship is not about here. It's about there. One of the hardest things for us to do when we come and worship God is to leave the world outside the doors. I know a woman when I was growing up, I heard a confession. You know, the, that was back in the days when confessions were kind of not that rare. Now they're just totally like unheard of. And she confessed out on the front porch after the preacher had left. She said, and I heard his comment. He appreciated her so much for her attentiveness during his sermon. He was watching her and she was just locked in and she didn't move bad an eye or anything. But when we got outside, she said, I just couldn't, I couldn't bear telling him the truth, she said, I was going through a, making a pattern for a dress in my mind. It's hard to leave the world outside. But think about it when you come before the throne room of God and you start thinking about what I'm going to do this afternoon or tomorrow or what's going to happen this week or trip I'm going to make or the one I just got back from. And you start thinking about, wow, the service really went by fast. And you might as well stay at home. Worship is not about here, it's about there. And the Apostle John, he, he warned us, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Our patterns prove our priorities and our priorities reveal our passions. Think about your worship patterns. And when I say think about it, don't Again, it, it's not something you can just do right now because it demands more thought. That checklist is something on an airplane, uh, that pre-flight. You better go through every bit of it. Otherwise, you can deceive yourselves and think this thing's ready for everyone. And it may not be. It just takes missing one if that's the one that's the problem. And with the deception going on in the world and only 6% having a true biblical um, worldview, 6%, really? Are we not any better than that? Praising God, being thankful to God, our attitude, our gratitude, all your heart at all times. You know, the thing about it is, is we may think worship is a Sunday thing. 
It is for us as a group of believers to come together. It's a blessing to be able to do that. And fortunately, we live in a country that allows us to do that. I'm thinking our numbers may grow if somebody had guns all over the place and we're trying to grab people up. It seems like during persecution, the church grows. And maybe we need a little bit. Not that I want it. We worship God. We praise God. But we don't do it just on Sundays. We don't just stop loving God on Sunday, right? I mean, we either love Him or we don't. So what is your worship habits at home? Every day. Do you read His Word? Do you spend time in prayer? Where do you add in prayer? If you're thinking about that throne, it's hard not to drop to your knees and even prostrate yourself on your face. I didn't used to do that, I'll be honest with you. Here, not too long ago, I started doing that, and I got up, and I would do that before I go to work, but I get to work before six, so I found, found out that I need to get up earlier, and one day Alexa decided I need to get up about four o'clock. I didn't realize it till I was ready, so guess what? I had extra prayer time. God wanted me up. And I, Alexa made sure I did. We worship God, but we don't cut it off with what's happened in my life. And good times are bad. It's all the same. When things go right, yes, we can worship God, and we do. But when God is quiet, <coughs> when God's silent, when God says wait, even when God says no, it's all the same. It's the same God. We don't worship our circumstances. We don't worship our blessings. We worship God. So it's not dependent on what's happening in our lives, but it's an overflow continually out of our understanding of who God is and our admiration for Him as He is enthroned in heaven. Deep love and obedience to God. That's just a natural response. If you're not obedient, you need to check your love for God. Worship it's not just when we come together. It's an outflow of love that doesn't stop during the week. And that's why it's so much easier for people that have that. Maybe that 6% is doing that. Hopefully the 6% that has the biblical world, uh, worldview also has a scriptural <coughs> relationship with God the Father and Christ the Son. regardless of what's going on. And the Apostle Paul understood that. He was content no matter what happened, if he had much or had none. And he talked about none a lot, what he was without. But he wasn't complaining. He, he was bragging about that he got to do this. And this was the result of it. Maybe he was being punished by the world, but he had chosen God, not the world. As we close, I can't think of a better passage to challenge our desire to worship than this one in Psalm 103, 1 through 4. And I'm going to use one I don't normally use. It's the New Living Translation because after I looked at about four or five different ones, I really like the way it said it, and I think the content is the same. It's just the wording's a little different. Psalm 103, 1 through 4 says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. How can you not worship a God who does that? We can clearly see how insane this my truth and your truth is. 
It's a good way to stop the conversation because you both just say, oh, this is my truth and this is my truth. Okay, well, we'll go on our separate ways and find somebody else that maybe agrees with my truth. But that's not the truth. The truth is found in the Word. It is truth. What do your patterns prove about your priorities? And what do your priorities reveal about your passions? Have you discovered your worship truth? Is God calling you to make a change? You know, invitations are becoming the thing of the past. But I was always told when I started be getting into the sales part of the company, and that's just selling a job, and I did the detail part of it, of what it is we were trying to put together, is you never leave without asking for it. In other words, ask. Well, it's not my invitation, it's God's. And it's open each and every time that we end something here. If it's not offered, that doesn't mean it is not a standing offer, because it is. If you need prayers, if you need just strengthening, if you'd like to make a change and you'd like to make it public, don't get caught skipping God's invitation. If you have a need or want to say something this morning, God's invitation is open to all. If you have a need, will you come as together we stand and sing?